This presentation is from Jason Johnson, the Executive Director of the Friends of Lake Warner here in Hadley, Massachusetts. Jason's been with the Friends for six or seven years. He's a wetlands biologist, and he'll talk on the condition of the lake and the stream here in Hadley, Massachusetts. The subjects he speaks about are relevant to anybody that lives near a stream or a lake. Please listen to Jason. Thanks, everyone. Um, I just wanted to thank the uh, North Abbey Church for having us and for the New Hampshire Conservation District for sponsoring and organizing the, the workshop. Um, I just wanted to give you a little background about our organization. We are the only group that advocates for the lake and the river and watershed. Um, we do water quality monitoring and work on invasive plant removal on the pond. Um, we're lucky enough to have a pond that is not that developed, so we don't have a whole lot of lake of butters. Um, we have some large farmland and wildlife conservation area abutting us. This is the watershed. Um, the lake is down around here. UMass Amherst is over here. A more urbanized section of the watershed. We have a considerable amount of farmland right along the main stem here, and then up in Shootsbury and um, Leverett are the forest parts of the watershed. Um, this land has been farmed. The, the dam first went in in 1670, so this dam has been and lake has been here longer than any other structure in the watershed. Um, and all the houses and civilization that came afterwards was built up around it. So it has a long history of being a prominent part of the landscape. Uh, it was home to the first grist mill in this part of the valley. Uh, this is actually a shot of the third grist mill here after two others were destroyed by fire. This one was destroyed in 1925. And this is the broom tool factory and knife making shop of Caleb Dickinson and John Howe. Um, that was across the river on the other side. Both of those businesses were run entirely on water power. Uh, we have but a bunch of conservation land and this critical habitat. Uh, the lake is down here. You can see a big green corridor leading all the way up into Shootsbury and up into the Quadden Reservoir area. Uh, so this area is very important ecologically as a corridor for wildlife and as a resting spot for migratory waterfowl that's close to the Connecticut River. Uh, the problem that we have in Lake Warner is eutrophication. Eutrophication is nutrient enrichment. This is mostly nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, which is present in the water column. It's coming in from the tributaries. Uh, you have problems with reduced transparency, low dissolved oxygen, and excessive plant growth, uh, algae blooms, so this usually happens over a period of hundreds of years in a natural condition. And when we have development and activities in the watershed that are contributing additional nutrients, it can really accelerate so it can be tens of years. So we've seen dramatic changes in the lake over the last hundred years really is where it's, it's really accelerated. Um, we have fairly clear conditions in the early summer and the spring and early summer, and then again in the fall. And these are characterized in what's known as the mesotrophic range, so not quite eutrophic with um, the water column being completely obscured. But in summertime, July, usually it starts to kick off. We get big algae blooms and excessive plant growth that almost covers the entire lake surface. There's a Aerial photograph from 2016, which was a drought year, so the water was really low. You can see that the surface of the lake is just almost completely covered. Uh, we take temperature readings on the lake throughout the spring and summer and into the fall. Uh, last year was an exceptionally wet year, and so we had lower than average temperatures with big spikes here when we had big rainstorms. We look at dissolved oxygen throughout the water column. Um, you can see here, even at the lowest levels of the lake, the water, the dissolved oxygen is still really high. And then as soon as the plant growth starts to obscure the, the surface, it starts to drop off in the lowest regions. And um, 
This is the two meter region is dropping off by July. Uh, we still have good dissolved oxygen in the upper meter of the, of the lake and a good majority of the lake is less than three feet deep. So there's still plenty of habitat that's available. But a good portion of the deeper sections of the lake is virtually dead in the middle of summer. Uh, we look at transparency. Last year, transparency was really good because we had a considerable amount of rain, so there was a lot of freshwater inputs. Um, again, transparency is sort of re related back to eutrophic conditions. Our transparency was not that bad except between July, June, and August here. Uh, we've been looking at phosphorus trends over the long term. Uh, there were some studies that were done in the early 2000s, trying to get an idea of lake loading and how much the lake could actually tolerate. 2017-2018 um, were really high water years, and so we had accelerated erosion and considerable and levels that were just really elevated. And this is looking at phosphorus in tributaries. Also above ecological thresholds, that essentially is telling you how much it's going to take for excessive plants and algae to begin to grow. Uh, Tanbrook is draining most of Amherst and urban areas. Uh, Knightley Brook is draining right in the center of the watershed. Um, it comes into the lake above, and the Mill River represents a lot of the ag land that. Uh, that is draining and contributing to the main stem. Uh, we also look at bacteria levels for health and recreational purposes. Uh, our coli bacteria levels were, were elevated in the last two years that we've been sampling. Uh, historically, the wastewater treatment plant used to dump into the Mill River, which caused a lot of sedimentation of organic nutrients. Uh, the Mill River was also straightened to build Highway 116, which has uh, just increased the, the drainage and, and runoff that, um, that comes from the rest of the watershed. So looking at some of the restoration techniques, maybe looking at sinuosity here, increasing some of the area where floodwaters can be stored and wetland rehabilitation. Uh, we're getting a lot of drainage from UMass parking lots and urban stormwater from Amherst. Urban, uh, Amherst is dealing with their stormwater infrastructure, and Hadley is also looking at upgrading their stormwater infrastructure along um, the Route 47 corridor. So that's an important component for healing some of the runoff issues. Um, and for our ag, we're really looking to design drainage systems so that the water runs more, more slowly and stays on the landscape more than running off directly into the tributaries. Uh, this is part of our invasive plant collection. And really, the, the message here is that it's important to do more uh, restoration and reducing nutrients that are contributing into the watershed rather than having to clean them up after they get into the lake, because this becomes a very expensive and um, laborious effort to be to have to deal with the after effects of, of eutrophication. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing our other speakers.